Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear a report from Jill Robbins and Andrew Smith. Then, Brian Lynn presents this week's science report. Finally, we continue our national parks journey with a relaxing visit to Hot Springs National Park in the state of Arkansas. But first... In the American state of Kansas... A group of religious women have been calling on large companies to change the way they do business. The women are Catholic, Benedictine religious workers called nuns. They live together in a monastery called Mount St. Scholastica. The nuns, who call themselves sisters, pray and chant three times a day in their small church. Members of the Benedictine order have followed this way of life for about 1,500 years. But the sisters also put their money into investments in several companies. This gives them the right to propose changes to company policies at regular shareholder meetings that involve important decisions. For example, the women asked oil company Chevron to consider more carefully its human rights policies. They asked Amazon to publish how much money the company spends trying to influence government officials. And they proposed that several manufacturers of medical drugs reconsider ownership rights called patents that, they said, increase drug prices. Patents legally protect a company's right to manufacture and sell a product that it developed or owns for a limited time. Some of these companies, they just really hate us, said Sister Barbara McCracken. She leads the nuns' corporate responsibility program. She added that because they are a small group of women, the large companies might consider them like an unwanted insect. Until the 1990s, the nuns had few investments. That changed as they began to invest money to care for older sisters as the community aged. They invest what little money they have in corporations that meet their religious ideals. But they also invest in some that do not meet their ideal. So they push those companies to change policies they consider harmful. Sister Rosemarie Stahlbommer supervised the community's finances for years. She said it was important that the group invested in a responsible way. She added that they wanted to make sure their investments did not bring harm to others. The sisters at St. Scholastica and other Benedictine groups work closely with the Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility, or ICCR. The ICCR is an organization based in New York City that involves religious groups in organizing to push companies to change their policies. Tim Smith is a policy advisor for the center. He said the Benedictine nuns have been an important part of ICCR for years. He said that while it can take years to see companies change, the sisters have the endurance of long-distance runners. Support for many of the changes the nuns seek 
has grown over the years. Early on, their resolutions received less than 10% support from shareholders. But in some cases, they have received 30% or even over 50% support. Pushing companies to change comes naturally to McCracken. She has been a peace activist for many years. There's not a protest she wouldn't go to, said Sister Ann Shepherd. She said McCracken's past involved anti-war, anti-racism, and union-supporting demonstrations. McCracken entered the Benedictine community in 1961. She calls herself unusual for a person who lives in a monastery because she hates to miss a party. She and the other sisters follow the Benedictine rule to pray and work. At the center of much of what they do is the belief that the wealthy have too much, the poor have too little, and more should be shared for the benefit of everyone. To me, it's a continuation of Catholic social teaching, McCracken said of their activist investing. Care for the environment has long been of central importance to Mount St. Scholastica members. Their college's graduates include Wangari Mathai, the Kenyan environmental activist and Nobel Peace Prize winner. Mathai died in 2011. One of their top concerns is climate change. They use much of their 21 hectares of land for solar panels, community gardens, and 18 beehives that produced about 360 kilograms of honey last year. Their activism has often led to criticisms that they are too politically liberal. They recently received attention after they responded to statements made by Harrison Butker, a professional American football player. Butker had given a speech at nearby Benedictine College, co-founded by the Benedictine nuns. In the speech, he suggested that most of the women there would be more excited to be wives and mothers than anything else. In a written statement, the women expressed concern with the idea that being a homemaker is the highest calling for a woman. The nuns are not married and do not have children. Many of the sisters have doctoral degrees. Most have worked in professions. Members of their group include a doctor, a lawyer of Catholic Church law, and a professional violinist. The sisters received angry phone calls after they released their statement. At the same time, the nuns are strong supporters of the team Butker plays for, the nearby Kansas City Chiefs. They often wear the team's red and gold colors to religious services on days when the team is playing. Sister Mary Elizabeth Schweiger helped write the nuns' statement. It came from a very basic understanding of who we are and the values that we hold true, Schweiger said. We just thought that voice had to be heard because we believe very much in being inclusive. Sister McCracken said that following their religious beliefs brings them into contact with political and economic issues. It's just the nature of being an active citizen, she said. McCracken is nearly 85 years old and cannot be as active as she once was. But pushing companies to change gives her a sit-down job when you can't go to the streets. The members of Mount St. Scholastica do not retire, not really. We don't use that word, McCracken said. She added that if they still have the ability to think clearly, we just keep going, you know. I'm Jill Robbins.
and I'm Andrew Smith. The American Space Agency, NASA, has launched an instrument to measure the world's carbon and methane levels in an effort to help fight climate change. The instrument is attached to a satellite called Tanager-1. It launched August 16th aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from NASA's Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Ground controllers reported they successfully established communications with the satellite shortly after launch. A statement from NASA said the satellite is equipped with a gas-seeking instrument powered with imaging spectrometer technology. A spectrometer is an instrument used to study the chemical composition and structures of substances. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, developed the imaging spectrometer instrument. The joint project also involved other organizations, including Planet Labs PBC. The private company helped build the Tanager-1 satellite. Tanager-1 is one of two satellites developed as part of the public-private partnership, the Carbon Mapper Coalition. The other satellite has not yet been launched. The coalition says it aims to support the collection of detailed data on methane and carbon dioxide emissions worldwide. The coalition hopes to use the data to drive reductions in methane and carbon pollution. Scientists have linked carbon and methane emissions to warming temperatures on Earth. Many climate experts blame most of the warming on pollution caused by human activities. NASA says the instrument aboard Tanager-1 measures hundreds of wavelengths of light that are reflected by Earth's surface. This method permits the instrument to find sources of carbon and methane based on the light wavelengths they show. The process produces fingerprints that the imaging spectrometer can identify, NASA said. This data can be used to provide highly detailed information on where the world's carbon and methane come from. The level of detail is so exact, it can even identify individual facilities and equipment, the space agency added. Lori Leshen is director of the JPL, which is based in Pasadena, California. She said in a statement, the imaging spectrometer technology is the product of more than 40 years of development at NASA. Leshen said such detailed emissions data can help policymakers, governments, and environmental organizations worldwide. When fully operational, Tanager-1 will aim to capture data across 130,000 square kilometers of Earth's surface each day. This will permit scientists to identify specific gas clouds releasing carbon dioxide and methane. NASA said the collected data will be publicly available online at the Carbon Mapper Data Portal. 
NASA says about half of methane emissions worldwide are caused by human activities. The biggest polluters are called super emitters, said Carbon Mapper Coalition Chief Executive Riley Duran. He told the Reuters news agency that super emitters produce more than 100 kilograms of methane per hour. This level of release could add up to 20 to 60 percent of an area's total emissions in some industries, Duran said. In addition, the agency noted there is now 50 percent more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than there was in 1750, an increase largely due to the extraction and burning of coal, oil, and natural gas. Duran said in a statement, the Carbon Mapper Coalition is a good example of how organizations from different sectors are uniting around a common goal of addressing climate change. He added that having the ability to exactly identify the sources of carbon and methane can drive significant action around the world to cut emissions now. The launch of Tanager-1 came after NASA's February deployment of the PACE satellite. It is designed to closely study the world's oceans and atmosphere. PACE stands for Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem. The satellite will spend at least three years studying the environment from an orbit 676 kilometers above the Earth's surface. I'm Brian Lynn. Now, Brian Lynn joins me to talk more about his science report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Sure, Ashley. Thank you for having me. This week, you reported on a NASA satellite that will aim to capture detailed data on carbon and methane levels around the world. Why don't we look at some of the vocabulary words used in your report that may be new to some of our listeners. Okay, sure. So one of the words appearing multiple times in the report is emission. Uh, this term is often used in stories about climate change, specifically to describe the release of gases that can harm the environment. So a basic definition of emission would be the production and release of something, or put even more simply, to send something out. Um, often this is related to emissions of gas or radiation in the atmosphere, but it can be used to describe other things as well. And I noticed another form of this word was also used in the report, emitter. This one is also a noun and shares the same root as emission, correct? Yes, that's right. And this word, emitter, is a form of the verb emit, which, again, shares the same meaning as emission, to send something out. So, in this case, emitter describes the source or person doing the emitting. And, again, as mentioned before, the emitting can relate to a range of things in addition to gas. Uh, for example, any kind of light or sound can also be emitted. Another word defined in the report was reflect. How was this one used? Yes, so a simple definition for reflect would be to send back or bounce off of something. In the sentence it is used in, reflect is describing beams of light bouncing off the Earth's surface. Perhaps a good way to explain this term is to use it together with the word mirror. 
when a person looks into a mirror, their own image is reflected onto the mirror, meaning we can see ourselves. And then we could use the noun form of the word reflection to describe what image we can see. Are there other words you would like to discuss? Okay, how about extract? A basic definition for this word is to take something out. Um, in this report, it is used to describe the process of capturing coal, oil, and natural gas for energy production purposes, but extract can also be used to describe the removal of many things not related to energy, and when used as a noun, extract can also refer to the item or substance that was removed. So, for example, a substance removed from a plant is called an extract. And you might have noticed the pronunciation changed based on which meaning we're using. So when using the word to describe taking something out, we emphasize the last part of the word, extract. But when using it as a noun, the first part is emphasized, extract. Great. Well, thanks again for joining me, Brian, and thank you so much for those helpful explanations. You're welcome, Ashley. Thank you for having me. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. Sometimes a visit to a national park means hiking rugged trails and climbing high mountains. Other times, it means crawling through caves or rafting down a wild river. But we want to take it easier. So, we head south to the state of Arkansas. It is home to a national park that is perfect for resting and renewing a tired body. Visitors treat themselves to one of its natural thermal baths. Humans have been enjoying the warm waters for thousands of years. Welcome to Hot Springs National Park. Most national parks are far from cities and industry, but Hot Springs is different. It covers more than 2,200 hectares in and around the city of Hot Springs, Arkansas. Congress approved special protection of the area in 1832. Known unofficially as America's Spa, it became a national park in 1921. The park's geothermal springs and other resources have long been used for therapeutic bathing. The average temperature of the hot springs is 61 degrees Celsius. The thermal mineral waters reportedly help ease many health problems, including arthritis and rheumatism. The springs emerge along the western edge of Hot Springs Mountain. Scientists say the hot springs are made of rainwater that fell in the Hot Springs area thousands of years ago. The rainwater slowly dripped down to the Earth's crust. When water rises back up to the surface quickly and does not have a chance to cool, hot springs form. 
Hot Springs National Park's early bathhouses were simple structures. They were made of canvas and lumber. They were built right over some of the natural springs. Later, businessmen built more complex wooden structures, but those structures were frequently damaged by fires and from exposure to water and steam. Beginning in the early 1900s, stone, stucco, and brick structures replaced the wooden bathhouse buildings. These large and much more elaborate structures still stand today along what is known as Bathhouse Row. These bathhouses were built along the eastern bank of Hot Springs Creek. The hot water from the hillside springs flows down a system of wooden troughs and into the buildings. Each spring was said to help cure different kinds of conditions. Some of the early names referred to their chemical properties. Others were named after the part of the body that its waters could best help. There was once a spring called kidney and another named liver. Eight buildings line Bathhouse Row today. They are very large. Many of them are three levels. But most of them no longer offer therapeutic water treatments. Instead, they house park shops and the visitor's center. But one has remained open for more than 100 years. The Buckstaff Bathhouse has operated continuously since 1912. It is one of the best preserved bathhouses within Hot Springs National Park. Visitors today can enjoy traditional thermal mineral baths. The baths are different temperatures and have different properties. Another bathhouse offers a more modern spa experience. Quapa Baths and Spa also sits along Bathhouse Row. It was renovated and reopened in 2007 on Hot Springs 175th anniversary. When you are done with your relaxing bath, there is still more to enjoy at Hot Springs National Park. Visitors can hike along the more than 43 kilometers of trails in the park. You will find unusual rock formations and views of the surrounding rolling hills. The landscape provides evidence of the area's hot spring history. On the Tufa Terrace Trail, you will see huge deposits of tufa created by the flowing springs over thousands of years. Tufa is a kind of rock shaped by water. But you do not have to hike to see the sights. There are beautiful mountain roads to drive as well. However you explore Hot Springs National Park, you can't help but relax. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Ashley Thompson. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr.